Here's a fan theory. The first generation of Pokemon games begins after the conclusion of a massive war. Okay, so you've played Pokemon. And even if you haven't, you've probably managed to absorb most of the premise through the process of cultural diffusion. And for the record, we're dealing mostly with the game here, but I would be curious to know if what we're gonna talk about transfers at all to the TV show. But just as a quick refresher, in the original games, you play red, you catch and train Pokemon, you battle them with other people who do the same. There are gyms, championships, good guys, bad guys, and so on. Professor Oak gives both you and your rival blue starter Pokemon, and you begin your Poke journey. But soon, you may begin to notice something weird. Your pop isn't around. Blue is an orphan. Most of the people you meet are either young, like you, or seemingly pretty old. There are very few people who are middle-aged, and most of them work at gyms. There is a conspicuous lack of adults. A fan theory known as the Kanto War Theory, or Pokemon War Theory, hypothesizes that this is the case because immediately preceding the events depicted in Pokemon Red and Blue, there was, in fact, a war, in which many, if not most, of the adults in Kanto were killed. A conversation with Lieutenant Surge, the Vermilion City gym leader, seems to solidify the whole theory. And as the Pokemon War Theory creepypasta entry puts it, quote, you realize you are among the first generation of people to live in peace at post-war time. The basic premise, beyond the dearth of adults, is that a war would explain the world's focus on combat and training. It would explain why, until later games, there isn't much by way of infrastructure or anything beyond homes, gyms, and hospitals. A war would explain the lack of communication between regions and the player's seemingly special, though in no way completely unique, status as a traveler or adventurer. It would also explain why Professor Oak gives out a Pokedex to new trainers, quote, to either collect or verify information lost during the war and to determine which species of Pokemon survived the conflict. But who, you may ask, fought? in this war. I've seen posts saying that the war was between Kanto, representing Japan, and Unova, representing America. Source here. In an exhaustive post by Insightful Panda, it's argued that the war must have been between Kanto and the neighboring region of Johto. Panda claims that the former attempted to annex the latter. Insightful Panda argues that Johto is a likely candidate for war with Kanto because there is evidence that their government, culture, history, and Pokemon population intertwine. The Pokemon League unites or perhaps just simply intertwines the two lands, it's possible to read into their architecture to see the Kanto influence in certain parts of Johto as a result of, or apology for, attempted annexation. Panda draws on the hubris of the fighting type gym in Saffron City, and even the existence of Missing No, which they attribute to the movement of Pokemon originally in Kanto, over to Johto to justify a potential tense relationship between the two regions. Already though, there's some difficulty at the beginning. First and foremost, no one really talks about the war. After a war's conclusion, you may wish it never happened, but to bury it completely is kind of unheard of. If the impact were great enough to affect infrastructure and overall population, wouldn't it be at least a passing topic of conversation? Unless the war happened a really long time ago, but that's not really the premise of this theory. Also, in a country or region where nearly all adults would go into service, a few other things would have to be the case. First, if there were a draft and not a massive standing military force, which maybe there was, there would be conscientious objectors, resistors, and evaders. In short, the war would be a massive political item which, much like the Vietnam War in America, would have created a visible and vocal class of people. Two, if there was no draft and Kanto citizens were just, like, totally into going to war, either actually or as a construction of the state, I'd expect more nationalistic messaging throughout the game. Kanto, in short, would resemble, say, North Korea. And third, media is an inextricable facet of any war. The Pokemon universe has televisions, movie studios, theaters, and newspapers. A recent war would have a presence on most, if not all, of these. Even if the war was long enough ago that battlefields have regrown their grass, it's unlikely that all cultural signifiers of the effort would be erased or avoided. There are, of course, counter-arguments to these counter-arguments. Red is a child, for one, and so it's arguable that the whole game is from a child's perspective. Everything is much simpler, less political, significantly less complicated than it is actually. Arguably, this is also an explanation for the characteristics of the game which give rise to the war theory in the first place. When you're a kid, everyone who's older than you is basically the same age, and probably the only infrastructure you're interested in is sports or entertainment. 
I guess until you get hurt, that is. Really, by framing the start of Pokemon as the epilogue to a major conflict, I think we turn Red into a kind of uniter of worlds, almost. Insightful Panda touches on this when they say that it's not until the second generation of games that communication between the two theoretically warring regions is fully repaired. Playing as gold against Red, your former self, signifies true peace between the Kanto and Johto regions. Except, well, I don't think there's much solid evidence of not peace from the start, just a whole lot of circumstance, which is great and fine. That is the fun of fan theories, turning circumstance into substance, defending unannounced connections in the search for unexpected meaning. So we're maybe led to ask, what is it about the Pokemon world that would make this theory, in light of all of its shortcomings, desirable? Well, maybe it's that Pokemon as a world is just too tidy. It's all very nice and innocent. Such a quaint state arising in response to a great catastrophe lends depth. Pokemon training becomes not unlike chess during the Cold War. Ultimately harmless in and of itself, but representing so much more. One way to navigate this theory's shortcomings in the name of that added depth is to consider Red as a child forging out into the world in the wake of some imagined societal catastrophe. Meaning if we hold this fan theory by extension of the fact that we think of Red as holding it about him himself in his own world, we can explain why so many of those important war-related details are missing. Red perceives some tension in the world, of which there is little or no physical evidence, and tasks himself with addressing it under the auspices of uniting previously warring nations. Because, you know, he's a kid and kids are imaginative. I think we can also see how this contextualizes the actions of the player. The training and collecting of Pokemon is no longer just an exercise in growth, discovery, completionism, or even a simple hero's journey. It's nothing less than the reuniting or perhaps uniting of regions, of eventual allies, if not a republic. In the way Pokemon, like the animals themselves, become the most meaningful in a collection, perhaps there's some obscure argument buried deep within the Pokemon story that the same is true for states or regions as federations. Maybe this is what Red imagines himself to be doing, uniting people and lands and across the many generations of the game itself, what we should imagine ourselves to be doing. Gotta catch them all. United Republic Edition. What do you guys think? Was there a massive war before the events of the first Pokemon game? And even if there wasn't, why might people want that to be the case? Scenery change, let us know in the comments and I will respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. In this week's comment response video, we talk about your thoughts regarding being literally yourselves except via images on the internet. If you wanna watch that one, you can click right here or find a link in the doobly-doo. Two small bits of news, in case you missed it, Idea Channel now has a t-shirt, which you can find at DFTBA. And at the end of this month, I'm going to be in Vienna talking at TEDx Vienna. So if you are in that neck of the woods, maybe think about coming to say, hey, we'll put a link to both of those things, t-shirt and TEDx info in the doobly-doo. This week's episode was brought to you by the hard work of these reds and blues. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit links in the doobly-doo. And the tweet of the week comes from the Jade Aria who points us towards a webcomic that is very related to all of this talk about seeing things that are literally you. Oh, and one other thing, starting next week for seven weeks, Idea Channel is going to have another sponsor, which is very exciting. Uh, it's gonna work remarkably like the way that it did when we worked with Squarespace. At the end of every video, I'm gonna say a thing. Uh, there's gonna be one difference, which is that I will say a very short thing at the beginning of every video as well. Uh, if you have any questions about the way sponsorship works with regards to Idea Channel, uh, you can watch this video. We'll put a, a card that pops up here um, that explains sort of how our relationship with our sponsors works, uh, which is a little bit different from um, a lot of other YouTube channels because of our relationship with PBS, but uh, we're super excited because, you know, hey, means we get to, we get to keep the lights on.